Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Uh, we're going to continue the study on the book of Judges, uh, particularly uh, relating to the line of Gideon, putting these on a the line. Uh, but we can now begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for this new week, for the blessings of the past Sabbath. And um, we invite your presence into our hearts, into our homes, into this study. We need to understand these things because the time that we are living in is a time of uncertainty and a prophetic time. We need to know where we are on these lines and our responsibility uh, that, we that you have given us, that we can fulfill those roles. And so we ask, Lord, for your spirit to be here now as we open your word together. Help us to discern clearly what is truth. Bless each person in their day-to-day -day lives and help us with our, our struggles and the trials that you have given us that make us dependent upon you. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, on Thursday, now I know there was a question that I asked people to think about. I can't remember what it was. Um, so I'm just going to go here. Um, so it's... Now, uh, one little note about the the study on on Thursday. It was number two twenty, and and Ron Knight had made a note uh, regarding the study uh, that the topic was restoration, uh, and he puts a quote in in there where he quotes me um, from the study, uh, where I say this is a restorative message. The whole purpose of this message that God has given us is to bring together this movement so that it can be united in accomplishing a task of giving a message to the Levites, to the Seventh-day Adventists who are searching for light. That's the purpose of this movement. Nothing in what we are doing is meant to attack any person. As far as we understand, every single person in this movement is still being called to come to the upper room. And... And we can see that God has been leading us in this direction for quite a while. Um, you know, even prior to December 25th, 2021, you know, even, you know, we basically could go all the way back uh, to our disappointment and uh, to July 19th. So, so we can see how this, this has been the message. This is the message that's connected to, because remember, in uh, Judges chapter 8, we're saying that this is a line that is um, a zoom in to the December 25th, 2021 date. And Judges 7 was a zoom in to July 18th. Judges 6 was a zoom in to November 9th, uh, 2019. So, so we can see then that these, these lines are 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 part of this bigger line right so this bigger line is this line of the 777 days which which actually is connected to uh, a bigger line it's part of a, a the 777 days is not the complete line it's part of a line where we mark um raffia and paneum being midnight in the midnight cries being november 9th 2019 and july 18 2020 and then we mark uh, December 25th, 2021 as the Sunday law. So we've, we've taken Judges, the story of Gideon, and we've taken these three chapters and we've zoomed them into those way marks uh, that exist on that line. But we know that line itself is not the line that has midnight in the midnight cry Sunday law beginning at 9-11, right? So we know that that line itself exists as a parallel to what line? Uh, 
what line is that that line that we, we have been in with this these three dates? What line is that parallel to familiarite history? Wasn't it uh, 1860s? Um, we were just talking about that not too long ago. Well, it wouldn't be that line because it's going to be Millerite history, not not Adventist history. Oh, I was Millerite. thinking, I was thinking April through October of 1844. Okay, so it's not. So we would we would have to look at Samuel Snow's line, right? And I'm gonna erase this. So remember, this was this was a problem that uh, Jeff and I had in understanding Samuel Snow's letter. So let's let's look at this again. I, um, so remember, we have here our line, um, which is going to have nine eleven, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. So this, and these are a doubling, right? Midnight and midnight cry really are the same way, Mark. You're still and, sharing, by the way. Oh, I'm still sharing. Sorry about that. I did turn the camera on. <laughs> I've got you. I double clicked on the small photo. Yeah, but it's just for recording. I need to have. Uh, oh, yeah. So. <clears throat> so let's get here. Just. Stay in a second here. It's going to look crazy, but the cord was tangled. Move that. Okay. So, so Jeff and I had had this problem because when we looked at this line and we looked at Samuel Snow's letters, we know that this is April 19th in Millerite history. This is July 21st. This is August 15th. And this is October 22. But Samuel Snow's letters begin prior to 9-11. Does that make sense to people what I'm saying? That is prior to April 19th, Samuel Snow has this line, and his line is going to go like this. You know, you're going to have February 16th, and this is going to be, oh, I'll put it like this, February 16th. And this is going to be July 18th, right? So he's going to have these letters. And, and the center of this, uh, April 19th is the first day of the first month, right? So you got the first day of the first month. And we know that we're going to have a Passover on either side of these, right? We're going to have the May 2nd Passover. So this is going to be uh, April 19th. This is going to be May 2nd. And over here, you're going to have April 3rd. And April 3rd is a Passover. These are Passovers. And what does this represent in Samuel Snow's letters, these two Passovers? <clears throat> Anybody know? Well, they're the <clears throat> they're the first and the second Passover, so you're talking first month and second month. Okay. Um, yeah. So 
It's not the first and the second month. I mean, depends what you mean by that. This is actually the 13th month. And this is the first month, according to the correct biblical calendar. The rabbinic Jews kept the Passover on April 3rd, as the, 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 uh, the Karite Jews, right? So they had the wrong Passover. Because they weren't using the biblical calendar. They were using the rabbinic calendar. Right. So this is the false Passover. This is the true. So it's not it's not the first and second Passover, though. You bring up an interesting point. Because if we think about it, remember, there is a first and second Passover, correct? Right. And correct. The ones that that were unclean here. Right. That they weren't able to keep the Passover on the first Passover, this would have been the Jews' second Passover, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> and so, so it could represent this group of people that are keeping the second Passover, because we do have that apply to our history too. And we use uh, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 29 and 30, dealing with the call uh, to, um, to Northern Israel which is paralleling the call to the Levites, which would also parallel the call here. So, so there is something there. But the main point, the main problem that Jeff and I were having is if Samuel Snow's message starts before 9-11, how do we account for that, that this is a message that really comes after 9-11? And the solution to that problem came with the idea that there are two 9-11s, right? So that when we parallel Millerite history, you know, we take 1798 and we're going to have this August 11th, 1840. Well, we know that this is 9-11 as well as April 19th, 1844 is also 9-11. Right. Then we have midnight, midnight cry, and the Sunday law. Right. So, so if we are to understand this history here in Samuel Snow's letters that we're typifying, that this is typifying um, a history that has 9 11 being marked by August 11th, 1840. So, Samuel Snow's letters really come into here. Right. That three days before midnight, his his July 18th letter. And after August 11th, 1840, he's going to have his February 16th. I mean, it's obviously going to be in 1844. But but you see the point. That when right. we have these two 9-11s, we can take Samuel Snow's letters and say that they're. As far as 9-11 is concerned in Samuel Snow's letters, it's this 9-11 that his letters begin after. But that means that this 9-11 has a place in Samuel Snow's letters. And what is that place? Well, that, that place is this 9-11, April 19th, being this 9-11. Now, that's confusing to people because these are the same historical events. But 9-11 shows up in Samuel Snow's letters, in a sense, in two places. It occurs here as August 11th, 1840, but it also occurs as a waymark in his lines. Does that make sense to people? Anybody have a problem with this? Now, so if we see that Samuel Snow's letters then go to July 18th, that this th period of three days is a period that's representing um, the prediction before midnight. And that if we are still in Samuel Snow's letters, we're not yet to midnight in this line, right? 
Correct. Yeah, so this line, of course, which is this line, that means we're not to midnight yet. So we have these period of three days that symbolized. But in that period of three days, remember Samuel Snow's letters, um, since we're repeating this history, uh, we have been repeating, we've had lines that are actually zooms in to Samuel Snow's letters to different waymarks. That is, we've had lines that have midnight and the midnight cry, and they're part of this line because this is really this part of this movement uh, that's connected with the proclamation of midnight. Exactly where, where we would start this, I haven't determined where we would take Samuel Snow's message, but my guess would be that this is um, this history because we have these Passovers, and from these Passovers, we have a division that happens because the Passover is a division that happens between Judas and the disciples, correct? <clears throat> Agreed. Right. Yeah. And, and so we have these two Passovers, the false and the true. And April 19th, the first day of the first month, marks this division. In a sense, this is all part of a unit. But we can zoom into here and we can say that these are different uh, divisions that happen within this movement. And uh, the way that I understood this was this was 2014 um, and this was 2017. And we kind of grouped this all together. That is, we took May 2nd and made that 2014. But these are really the same way, Mark, right? These are all just brought together. And when, when we understood the mirror, when we understood that this was all a mirror, that May 2nd was the center date between July 18th and February 16th, then we could see, and, and the number of days there, 777 seven, seven, seven days and then 777 seven, seven days, or uh, two months and six days, which this is a symbol of. And also altogether, um, Cardinally, it'd be 153 days. So it had all these different symbols attached to Samuel Snow's letters. But it's these Passovers that are marking this division. And so, you know, it's something that we're going to have to look at again in more detail now that we understand a bit more how to construct these lines so that we can um, parse them out a little more clearly. But <clears throat> Uh, the main point that, that I'm trying to make here is that when we take these dates uh, that we we have, so just to do it this way, we got 9-11 over here, and we mark this as raffia and paneum, right? This, of course, was the Sunday law. And we, we looked at that these were the events. This was going to be November 9th. Uh, 2019, this was going to be July 18th, 2020, and this would be December 25th, 2021. But we know that we, we aren't actually to this on this line, right? This bigger line of, of Jeff's, this line, which is the line of our history from 1989 to the Sunday law. And we've actually been zoomed into something, and the zoo thing that we're zoomed into would be this April 19th date, or, or maybe better, it's not, it's, it's zooming into this somehow, I don't know how to describe it, but 9-11 as an extension of August 11th, 1840. So, or maybe, maybe it is this other 9-11, that's what I'm not certain about, how we're, how we're marking where we're zoomed in. So we're zoomed into something, right, in this Samuel Snow's letters line. Uh, maybe it's a zoom into 2014 or something like that. I don't know it's because we haven't, we haven't sorted all this out yet. But it is a zoom into something bigger. But then our zoom in right now, so we have these dates, we can take these and we can say, well, this is actually July 18, 2020. And this midnight is December 25th. Uh, 2021, because there's the three days in that call, the 20th day of the ninth month. But we're not really yet at midnight because somehow we're still just zoomed into 
uh, July 18th, but we are zooming into now December 25th, 2021, but that's, that's leading to midnight. That is December 25th, 2021 is going to lead us to this midnight way mark on this bigger line, right? Because what is midnight on this bigger line? Is it not the formalization of the second angel's message? The message to the Levites? Right? Which is going to be empowered here at the midnight cry? Is that how we would understand it? And so since this movement is moving towards midnight, that's that's what's happening right now. When we're here at midnight, this movement must be united and have a message so that it can give the message. So when we get to Boston, Boston is Samuel Snow riding up on a horse. He doesn't ride up on the horse here. He rides up on the horse here in Boston, right? He has this message to give. He's going to give it. He's going to proclaim that it's midnight. But it's not going to be till Exeter that that message is going to be empowered, right? So we must be moving towards this. We can't, we're definitely not there yet. And so all that's been happening in this movement is to move us to, to Boston. Would we agree with that? <clears throat> it would look that way. Yeah, I don't see how else we could perceive this. How else we could put it together. Because that's really what's been happening with this movement. Now, we thought we were over here, you know, in this history. But we're really in this history. And, and we could see that there is a parallel between October 22nd, 1844, and our disappointment of July 18th. But July 18th typifies, because this is 187, and October 22 is the 187th day of the year. So July 18th, this experience is a typification of what's going to happen in the Millerite movement. Samuel Snow's letters are laying down and pointing to this date. So, so we can see how July 18th is serving that same purpose in Millerite history that it does in our history. Now, one of the things that, that wasn't always clear about this, when we take these lines, we can see that this is actually the Sunday law. I don't know if people know what I mean by that. But if the mighty angel of Revelation comes down here at 9-11, then this is part of the Sunday law. This is the Sunday law. This is the loud cry. This is the close of probation. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. So, so midnight here is a symbol of the Sunday law. And so there is in some ways in which we, we don't fully understand this because we know that this is the Sunday law on Jeff's line, which is the actual Sunday law. But there is something here that the July 18th is leading to this prediction before midnight, these three days that leads to this way mark, which symbolizes the Sunday law. And, and so we still haven't sorted that out completely. But we do know that we come to the Sunday law at some point in our history. And it may be that that that's connected here, or it may be that that's, that's a level above us, a line above us, I don't know. But the way that I would understand it is that this Sunday law here is something that happens internally within the movement. If, if we're gonna understand July 18th and what we're doing. So, so we are another level down. So when we get to this midnight, this movement um, will have reached this, this way mark 
And then we're going to have this message swell to a loud cry, loud cry. So we can see that 9-11, we have the mighty angel of Revelation 18 come down here. But Ellen White always has it come at the Sunday law. So in some ways, the angel of Revelation 18 comes down here as well. And, and that would connect us to, to the history that we've been studying on Fridays, dealing with 1893 and A.T. Jones. So there is a Sunday law in 1888 as such. It doesn't happen, but he stops it. And there is a Sunday law that he sees as not being stopped in, in 1893. And, and that's paralleling our history. So, so we start to see these wheels within wheels, this complexity. But we also start to see how this is coming together, that we're understanding now what it is we're seeing. What we can't know is where specifically we are in the big scheme of things. We, we can't, until we get past waymarks, we can't tell that we're in a waymark, right? So when we get to midnight on this line that Jeff has laid out, when we get to Raphia, we will know it then. But we, we still will have many false summits before we get there thinking that it's coming, but not recognizing that there are experiences we have to go through first. And because and, that's what's been happening to this movement all along. But at some point we do get here. Whatever this way mark really represents, we just don't know it yet. Does that, does that help people a little bit? So right now we're zoomed into a waymark, which comes from the story of Judges, which has to do with Gideon, that we're saying is December 25th, 2021, and represents, because we're saying that Judges represents from 9-11 to 2023. And so we're, we're taking that application of Judges, based on Judges chapter 2, and saying that we're coming to this point that this movement is going to experience. And, and that point has to be something like midnight, right? Because July 18th in these three days, this leads us to the 20th day of the ninth month. Now we've actually passed it in December 25th, 2021, but we're zoomed into that way mark. And that way mark is going to extend to 2023. And it was done so by Colin when he made this Trump prediction on December 25th, 2021, at least in part, that it was done. Obviously, there's other things involved. And we have a date that ends on January 11th, 2023. So we see that this movement has to come to some kind of upper room in order for us to move on in these lines. So that's what we're studying when we're studying Judges chapter eight. Now, of course, we're gonna see that um, these, the story of Samson also is gonna illustrate this history. <clears throat> and, and of course, Abimelech as well. The, um... Second Passover for the rabbinic Jews was the 3rd of May, 1944. Okay. Yeah, and probably the Karaites would have kept the 2nd of May. And, and you realize why. Because how they, they count every single month based upon the observance of the new moon, but the rabbis don't. That makes sense. <laughs> Stephen, does that make sense? What, what I just said? So they wouldn't have kept the 14th day of the first month, you're saying? 
what 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 I'm saying is that the the Karaite Jews, yeah. So for the rabbis, they're going to have 30 days in that month. They're going to start that month on because uh, they're going to have their Passover, right? And they're going to have 30 days in that month. Does that make sense? Oh, I get you. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that their second Passover, they have to keep on the second. Um, well, no, what I'm saying is that you, there's going to be a difference between the rabbinic and the Karaite Jews. So in um, the Karaite Jews and the rabbinic Jews both kept uh, March 21st as the first day of the first month in 1844, right? So that's why you're going to see the 14th day is going to be April 3rd, mm -hmm. right? But then when you get to uh, that month, according to the rabbis, would have to have 30 days. But according to the Karite Jews, it would only have 29 days. Yeah, so they would have their second Passover on the 2nd of May. Yeah. Yeah, they'd have their Passover on the 2nd. But the, but, the, but the rabbinic Jews would have it on the 3rd of May. Okay, thanks. Does that make sense? I think I'm doing that right. Yes. Yeah, because they're going to have 30 days in their their month there. They're going to call it Nissan 30 when we're calling it Nissan 1. That is, April 19th is going to be the 30th day of the first month for the rabbis. Um, but it would be the fir first day of the second month for the Karaite. Or first day of the, it'd be the, pardon me, it'd be the, 30th day of the first month for the rabbinics, and it would be the first day of the second month for the Karaites. Yeah, so so the, the rabbis are going to have it one day later, the second Passover. Yeah, so anyway, it's, uh, I can just show people here. I'm looking at this. So this is 1844. And so if you look at this calendar here, if I go back to, this is the rabbinic Jews. So you can see the first day of the first month is going to be March 21st, 1844. That's the Julian date down there, but the Gregorian date that we use. And you're going to see that's going to be the first day of the 13th month for um, uh, the biblical calendar. And then when I go one month later, you'll see Nisan 1 is Nisan 30. But that's going to be for the Karaites. That's going to be ER 2. Right. So they're going to be one day off. So if I go um, to what we call the true Passover, May 2nd, that means the Karaite Jews are going to also keep May 2nd as the second Passover. But the rabbinic Jews are going to have to wait one day later for the 14th of the year, 14th day of, whoops. 14th day of the second month. So that's going to be May 3rd that the rabbinic Jews keep the second Passover. So they're going to be one day off from the Karaites. <clears throat> now, so the idea here is that we brought this up as a symbol. Um, and But the symbol still stands, even though the Karaite Jews and the rabbinic Jews have a different way of calculating this. And, and maybe that's even important here. Uh, because what would what would this second Passover be representing, right? So if we go back here, and it's going to be the Karaite Jews who are going to keep a Passover, the second Passover, on May 2nd, but it's going to be the true Passover. What would that then represent? What would be the difference between the Karaites and the rabbis in this regard? Sabbath and Sunday connection, uh, maybe? Sabbath Sunday connection? Yes. I'm thinking because there's like a one day difference. Okay. Um, well, that, I've never thought of that. I'm thinking more just that in order to get to, because the idea of the second Passover is those that were unclean prior, because they touched the body of a dead person or they're in, traveling in another country and they couldn't keep the first Passover. Um, 
that when they keep the second Passover, this represents that call that we have in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. So this is a call, a further call that goes to northern Israel, which represents the Protestants. Right? So there is this call of this group that come to this second Passover. So in a sense, this first Passover is this second Passover. The rabbis don't come to the call, but the Karaites do, if we want to put it that way. They would represent these two groups. Does that make sense? I think I see where you're coming from, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's starting to make sense. Yeah, and, and that typifies then our history when we get to the call to, to the Levites. Right, so it parallels that. Because it is the second Passover call. Or, or maybe not to the Levites so much, but to the Protestants. Maybe we should put it that way. Because they're going to join in that call when the two sticks are joined, right? Adventists are going to be called by this movement. But also at the midnight cry, the Protestants will be called to join us to stand at the Sunday law. So it may be typifying that. I mean, I know this is a little bit aside from, from the main point of our study, but I think it's an important point that we need to keep in the back of our minds as we you know, continue studying these lines and putting them in order. <clears throat> so thanks for that, Stephen, that observation. <clears throat> now, um, we had we had taken this. Um, we were dealing with Zeba and Zalmuna. Now, somebody had pointed out if we take the name Zeba and Zalmuna and we put them together and we count the gematria of the English words, it comes to one four four. And now we're saying that Zeba and Zalmuna are people in this movement, right? I thought we weren't <clears throat> that we were not making that type of an application that we were wow. making an application that these were also messages. Right. So they're that's messages. what I thought. Yeah, but people are connected to these messages. Let's put yes. It that. Okay. So they represent people connected to a message, and that message has to end. That is, it has to be killed. Right. Uh, yes. Now. Um, we have Sukkoth and Penuel represent the, representing the messages or the attitudes or the characteristics, whatever you want to call them, of the American group and the Canadian group. They have different characteristics. Uh, the, the Tower of Penuel represents the Watchtower, and the Men of Penuel are, are those that see the face of God. These are the elders. These are the ones that should be leading the movement, but they haven't been, right? And the, the men of Sukkoth are connected with the 77, um, with the 77 priests, or not priests, what are they, um, where was that? Uh, I can't think of the word. Um, where was the 77 that, uh, what were they called? Elders, right? Right. So there's um, yes, elders, the elders, the three score and seven, seventy seven. So here in this case, we're connecting this more to the chronology, right? Which is going to be more characteristic of the Canadian group, which would include Odilio as well in in this that sense. Even though he's not from Canada, but. Um, so, so Ziba and Zamuna represent these particular messages. Um, now, we know that these are left over from, because we're saying, now, now Stephen had brought up a point about Mount Tabor uh, that, that, that was quite a while before. So the number 
from the time that we have uh, Sisera to we have this story here with Gideon is how many years, Stephen? It's uh, 47. So you're saying it's 47 years. Now, that's based upon um, uh, Deborah and Barak. They, they're judges for how many years? 40. For 40 years. And then you're going to have um, the seven years of Gideon, right? Yeah. Or seven years in between of, of oppression of the Midianites, I guess I should say. Right? Yes. So that's 47 years. So Zeba and Zalmunna to have been at Mount Tabor in the story of Sisera, um, they would have had to have been fairly young. But now here, Zeba and Zalmunna are, are kings, right? But what if Zeba and Zelmuna are titles? Well, like Pharaoh. it's saying that they were there at Mount Tabor and they saw the faces of them, that they were like Gideon. Okay. They resembled the children of the king. So, so Stephen suggested maybe this is some other battle at Mount Tabor that's not mentioned. But, I mean, is it possible that Zeba and Zalmuna were teenagers fighting in that battle? Because it's possible, right? Um, but now that they're, they're, they're kings of Midian, and they're older, right? So they're in their, you know, early 60s or something. Is that possible? Or would we have to say that it's impossible because of the 47 years? No, I would have to consider the possibility. Okay. Now, th now there is another possibility that Zeba and Zamuna weren't particularly there, but that they heard about this afterwards. And you know, when it says "ye slew at Tabor," talking about uh, 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 the Midianites, right? Were the Midianites in particularly involved in the story of? Sisera. Well, okay. The Midianites and Sisera. I would think yes, but I thought you had just shot down the idea that Zeba and Zomuna had not been there based upon their response that these looked as the children of a king. Well, no, I, I'm just I'm just putting out the possibilities. I'm not shooting down anything. I'm just saying that Zeba and Zalmunna, what the, the consensus is that Zeba and Zalmunna were there, right? I mean, that's what everybody accepts. Okay, right. Right. Now, so that, you know, that, and it seems to me that that's what's being referenced here. Um, but we have no, no account saying that Zeba and Zalmunna were there. We just have what uh, Gideon says to Zeba and Zalmunna. What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? Um, so we know of the Battle of Tabor. It's the previous story, right? The story of Deborah and Barak and Sisera. So, so it seems that Zeba and Zalmunna were there, and Gideon knows that they were there. But whether whether how we sort this out, I don't think is really the point. The point is that we are connected to a particular story, Mount Tabor. And Zeba and Zamuna are connected to that story. And so they represent, however, however the explanation might be, they represent messages that are connected to an understanding that goes back to Parminder. That's the case that I've presented. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're saying that there, these are particular messages and the problem that these messages have, both Odilio's message and Collins, is that they have ignored the lines 
that have been unfolded to this movement since July 18th. That is, we have had light on the lines. And they're not looking at those things. I know that Odilio only cursorily has looked at things that we've done because he's busy all the time. And he's been working on his own things, at least the last time I talked to him. And I know that Colin just generally does not watch the videos. And, and lots of people in the movement aren't watching these videos, these studies. And it's a lot of stuff for people to watch. If you haven't been following from the beginning, it's pretty hard to just jump in and watch some of these videos. I know Colin did watch some of the Friday night presentations dealing with the presidents of the United States, right? So, so we have, but we know that the movement has been infected by Parminder's views that people still look at the lines the way Parminder presented. And they don't know that we've rejected those understanding of the lines. And we rejected them because they don't represent Millerite history. And, and Parminder rejected the idea that a waymark can typify another waymark. That is, he really rejected the idea that I can zoom into a waymark and see a line. He wanted to have these lines in this neat way that he had them very well defined, simplified, but incorrect. And those lines were misleading, right? And, and this goes back to Parminder, even when you deal with his prediction that he made in 2012 about the Sunday law, he never gave up his view of things. And, and this movement, once we passed July 18th, we sh should have known that there was something wrong with what Parminder had presented regarding the lines. And, and I presented it, what the problem was, because I knew about the problem prior. I knew about the problem back in 2018, actually even in 2017, even in 2016. I knew that there was something wrong with the lines because they didn't make any sense. What we were trying to do didn't make sense. Samuel Snow's letters even exposed it further. And mine and Jeff's solution of taking two 911s and, and placing them like that um, never really be became well known. And especially because in 2018, when we had figured this out at the, the camp meeting in, in Alberta here in August of 2018, we then had all this time setting stuff happening. And Parminder had presented this new understanding of the lines the priest Levites and the Nathanims in the way that he had presented them in 2018 in Italy. So now we have to contend with that. And so the movement never sorted that out. And if we had, we would have been able to see that we couldn't mark November 9th, 2019 as the event that we were predicting or July 18, 2020 is the prevent event we were predicting because we just didn't understand where we were. And we had the key there. Jeff understood Samuel Snow's letters and their significance. But we just, there was too much happening. And so after July 18th, we could easily place those lines correctly, at least the basic idea. And now we've continued studying these things uh, since December 26, 2021. And now we see the lines much more clearly. We can zoom into these waymarks. We can see a new line. We're not going to get the lines confused. We just don't know what level we're at yet, right? We can, we can clearly see how the lines are connected. So Ziba and Zalmuna, these messages, um, to me, have to be the messages just as we had in um, uh, the previous chapter dealing with, uh, um, I can't think of the names. Uh, no. Orb and Zeb? Yeah, Orb and Zeb. That's it. Right. And, and again, they also represent those two messages, but in a different line, right? So that they lead us up to there. But now we're zoomed into J December 25th, 2021 on this line. And it's going to bring us a little further uh, to the end of these messages, details regarding them. Now, we also have this... Um, This Ajither or Yither, the firstborn of Gideon, who doesn't up and slay 
Aziba and Gal Galmuna at his father's command, right? And and we were saying, what does either represent? Uh, those that wouldn't get up and speak out against the message? Yes, yeah, so there are voices. There are voices that could have been heard in all of these controversies. But they haven't been heard. And, and why is that? Mm. When, when I spoke up against what was happening, and I wasn't like being critical or anything, just asking questions for the most part, especially with Paul. Um, and I was shut down. Sorry. Make it much more difficult for other people to stand up to that message, right? People don't like being I shut agree. Down, right? So, you know, personally, from my perspective, I mean, I'm not trying to put anybody down about not supporting, you know, what was happening. But I really think that if people had spent a bit more time communicating with the people they knew or writing letters or emails or whatever, or even speaking up in meetings, um, that we could have been brought to address these problems sooner. Right? There were meetings going on where things were being said that no Christian should ever say about another person. Um, especially if they haven't talked to that person and tried to reconcile that people should have spoken up about, but that's me just, you know, saying what other people should have done from my perspective. But here, I think G either represents um, this group of people. Now, what does it mean though, that G either is the firstborn of Gideon? What, what would that, what does the firstborn symbolize? Yeah, and I, I don't think Jether represents those that just want the milk and not the meat. I don't think that's the issue here. Because if Jether, Jether is the firstborn, what does the firstborn symbolize? Um, he's the one that's going to be getting the inheritance, the mass of the inheritance, right? Okay, so, right. So if we have the firstborn, it's, it's the one that inherits. Uh, the double portion of the inheritance. And we know, of course, that 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 still continued, even though it was also symbolically uh, transferred to the Levites. But um, but it still does. There still is this role of the firstborn as a symbol. So these are those that have inherited the message, right? Right. And yet they're not going to stand up against Ziba and Zalmuna. Now it says they feared for he was he feared for he was yet a youth, and and in understanding this, um, I mean we could just take it in this very simple way that people would feel uncertain because of their lack of experience. Uh, that's pretty much the only thing that would hold me back from saying something is my uh, my um, lack of knowledge. And so this would represent those people that have not been there the whole time in this movement, but they are the firstborn. That is, they do have this inheritance that's been given to them, but they feel uncertain about speaking. One is they may feel that they have a lack of knowledge. Some people may feel that they don't, they can't enter into this, this discussion because they just don't know enough. And also who's going to listen to them, right? So Gideon's going to have to arise. And we know that Gideon represents the July 18, 2020 message. So that means there's going to be this light that's going to come from the July 18, 2020 message that's going to end these messages of Ziba and Zalmuna that will slay them. And then we have this part where it took and took away the ornaments that were on the camel's necks. 
So what are these ornaments that are on the camel's, camel's necks? What are they <coughs> What are they symbolizing? Islam. Okay, it symbolizes Islam. But we one of the things we have to look at is these have to do with messages. So if we're going to take an ornament, uh, this tire like the moon, right? What is it symbolizing? Because we know that Gideon's ephod is going to be built from this. And, and we have to decide how we're going to take the story of Gideon's ephod. Because I take it as, as not part of this line. I take it as a repeat and enlarge. As, I take it as a different story completely, right? But it's going to be connected to this. Now, when we take this idea about Islam, we, we had Islam connected with November 9th originally and July 18th, because when we go way back to when we first recognized that Islam was going, there were going to be these predictions about what Islam was going to do. Right? Midnight in the Midnight Cry. This this Jeff found when he was in, uh, I, I think it was in Austria and, and Wales in uh, the end of 2014. Right? So this is going to be presented early in 2015 that we're going to be making these predictions and, and that these were going to be these way marks um because we were just starting to understand the way mark uh well we didn't know exactly what they were but we came to understand the way mark of of midnight so that's going to develop and maybe it was in 2015 i might be getting that confused but i think it was 2014 anyway um Maybe we first developed midnight and then we developed this prediction regarding Islam. I, I, my memory is failing me on that point. But, but the point is, when we first had these, these prediction ideas that we were going to make, they were both going to be about Islam. They were going to be strikes by Islam. We didn't know that we were going to give a specific date. Uh, but then with Tess's message, we started to talk about the king of the north and the king of the south. And they became the main focal points of the Midnight and the Midnight Cry Waymark. So the Rafi and Paniam idea. But we were still going to have Islam involved, especially on the, the Paniam one, right? Yes. Yeah, they were going to be part of these catalysts or something in, in what was going to occur. It wasn't really well defined, I don't think. But then we, you know, we we passed November 9th and we had July 18th, and July 18th was going to be an attack on the United States by Islam. Right. There was yeah. uh, there was a lot of study that went into that too. Yeah. So so the message of July 18th is going to take away these ornaments that were on the camel's necks. And so there is something that we have um because we can see in Odilio's and Colin's studies that Islam isn't really there. Right? I'm sorry, I don't remember this. Well, Odilio's studies about the pandemic, there's no Islam in that study. Colin's studies about, you know, Trump, there's no Islam in that study. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But these ornaments that were on the camel's necks, the July 18, 2020 message is going to have to pick those ornaments off the camel's necks. That is, we're going to have to restore that message of Islam to our message. Is that, is that a possibility? Repeat that, please. We have to restore the message of Islam to our message. Or, I mean, that's one possibility. I'm just looking at this verse and just 
throwing it out there. Is that a possibility that that's what it means to take away the ornaments that were on the camel's necks? I'm not sure. Okay, and I'm not sure either. Now, now then we're going to have Gideon's ephod, right? Um, can I just make yeah. a comment here at this point? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we do know the the vision um, with the horses that they were on pulling wagons and then they had to get rid of the wagons and then finally they got to the they got to the horses where they were you know had all the baggage on the horses and then they had to cut the baggage off the horses so the horses could go further and eventually they got off the horses and then they they walked up uh can this vision be related to any of this stuff that we're discussing at this point well yeah i mean we've made that application already so um so are we cutting the baggages off? Are we cutting the baggage off or are we getting it out of the wagons and putting it on the horses? Well, I mean, you're trying to say, where are we in that vision? Right. That's that's basically what I'm asking. Well, because I, I keep seeing that and, and the stuff that we're uh, with all that stuff that we um, actually just shoveled onto the uh, the Islamic um a uh, symbol, uh, we've kind of, we've kind of over, you know, we kind of overdid it there. Um, it, or will it happen like that? I mean, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm just looking at it as, okay. are we cutting the baggage or are we taking it off the wagons? You know, I mean, I'm trying to figure out where we're at. Okay. So, so to here's... help me with what we're looking at right there. Okay. So I can try to help here. So, so we have an option. We could say that this movement is going to restore the message of Islam. That's what it means. Um, well, let's look at another possibility. So we know that God gave us this message regarding Islam, right? I mean, this, this becomes yes. foundational in Adventism. We know that 9-11 is about Islam, yep. right? Um, we know that then God gave us this understanding from the book of Ezekiel. And from uh, Revelation 9, which is the prophecy of Josiah and Josiah Lich's understanding of Revelation 9. So we have these two things. And they come together to give us this July 18, 2020 date. That's right. And we can connect this all structurally and chronologically to September 11th. Right? So, we, right. so all this structure, all of these dates, all of these, this that we we have it all points to that yeah now now that we have the story of gideon's ephod which i think relates to that right but it, it goes back over this history and so you know again i try to understand what's actually being said here i mean we know that gideon constructs this ephod and this ephod becomes a snare unto Gideon and into his house. Now, exactly what this means, exactly where we fit this in history, I don't know. Is this something still future that maybe we could, we could be going astray if we start to get too much into what Islam is doing because it's not really a major part of end time events? Right, because this really is about the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And maybe this, you know, this understanding that we had was to lead us to a certain point, but now we have to abandon it. Maybe that's what's being said. Or maybe there is a ephod that had already been constructed that was a snare, and that we would need to understand what that was. Right. So I, agree. I think it's I think it's important for us to sort through this. Yes, sir. Yeah, because we want to know. We want to know: Are we doing the right thing, or are we do doing the wrong thing? Right. And if we're doing the wrong thing, we need to correct it. Now, in this story, we have the message of July eighteenth, and the men 
saying, we want you to rule over us. But Gideon's going to refuse to rule over them. But he's then going to consent, or he doesn't even really consent, he suggests that we build this ephod. And, and we can see in this story of this ephod, what you have is you have pe people taking upon a role that they shouldn't take upon themselves. Yeah, unqualified personnel. Yeah. And and this becomes a snare unto Gideon. And if we say it's a snare unto the Gideon, it's a snare unto the July 18, 2020 message. So, so we really need to define what this is, what this ephod is. Now, my personal view is that there is this danger of wanting to control the message that that Gideon refuses, right? But, you know, remember, Gideon is a message. He's not, but there are people attached to a message. Now, we could go back and say that this is uh, December 6, 2020, or even before that. Now, what do I mean by that? Because it, we, we know that this message of July 18th is going to be rejected, right, on December 6, 2020. So how would we take this idea that July 18th is going to rule over us? How would we connect that? Would, would this be earlier? And then what's constructed, you know, uh, I have so many different ideas of what possibly could be happening with this story and where we could place it. Do we have to do this like you did the calendar where you <laughs> we, you mark it out every single day and try it in all these different ways until you finally figured out that that, that was this is the only way it could happen because the Passover happened at this time here and that one happened there. You, well, you to some, what I'm to some degree, we have to find where it fits. I mean... Yes. I mean, part of what we've we've done here, so just this construction of um, that we have here, we have this temporary construction. We can see this is really solid around December 25th. This October 2nd to 9th. So on October 2nd, I have that presentation where, um, well, it's, it's my last presentation on Hebrews chapter 8 that I present. We're marking Judges 8-8 eight, eight there. But I present that last presentation after the morning study in which Daniel Fontenot said that I was a Judas. And, and then we have some email exchanges, and the last response he gives me is October 9th, a week later. doesn't respond after that. And, and that's a week, right? And then we have 77 days that go to December 25th, 2021. And then 49 days to, and, and that's going to be Colin's presentation. And then Odilia's presentation on February 12th, right. the mandates. And that's going to be seven weeks apart. And if you put the 77 days and the seven weeks together, then you get 126 days. So, so here we can see this structure. And this seems pretty sound uh, on how we laid out the verses and, and so forth. And then we put he, over here, uh, February 16th, 2022. Now, this is the email uh, where connection to my, to our studies here that we've been doing are not in severed then at that point, right? Yeah. So there's this separation that occurs with this email. And we're lining that up, of course, with December 25th above, 2021, where Colin first presents his study, right? Right. Now, um, and then we have, and, and, and we're using Judges 8, 2021, um, where uh, Ziba and Zalmunna are slain by Gideon, right? So, you know, maybe that's not the best one, but that's, that's where I'm placing that, is that verse. And, and then you're, you're going to have Judges 8, 22, which is, of course, the next verse. And that's where the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And 
Um, so I'm looking at this as something that's still a going to be future, that is going to be January 11th. That, and, and so that's why, you know, um, but that's still tentative. I mean, these are just suggestions. Maybe there's some other way in which we should understand these way marks. Um, but if we're going to then take the story of, of the ephod, the question is, are we going to take this story and lay it over top of this history as another separate line? Or is it a continuation of this line? Does something happen in this movement in January 11th, 2023, that the movement, in a sense, uh, goes in a wrong direction? which doesn't really much make much sense if we come to the upper room there. So, so I, I would have to take that this story is some kind of repeat and enlarge the story of the ephod, not something that's going to happen. Because that just doesn't make sense to me. So it seems to me it must be something that had happened. Now, if, if we look at the story, so that just more suggestions, not conclusions. Um, so if we take Gideon's ephod to be us misusing the information that was given us, and that this became a stumbling block in our prediction of July 18, 2020, does that make sense to anybody? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? So if we take the story of the ephod as our misuse of the understanding that had been given us regarding Islam, right, and all the different things that we made in prediction, would it be illustrating our misunderstanding of the message that became a stumbling block for this movement? That, that we would have to see that that this ephod had been constructed already, that it's representing something that's past. Hmm. So the ephod is a representation of of the way they you communicated with God, right? Is is that what? Is that yeah. what we we're discussing, yeah. right? It was communication that's the, with God. Yeah. That's the per, the plate or the chest plate that had the twelve jewels in them, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is a form of communications with God. Hmm. Now, what have we been saying about um all this stuff? This stuff is from God. This stuff is from God. This stuff is from God. Well, I don't have any doubt that it's from God, but it's just the way that we apply it. Um so was there a wrong application being made? So what I'm thinking is pos that's that is a, a huge possibility. Yeah. Because now now we made a structure, right? And and now that structure came from God. I mean, you know, the dates and all these things, because it was a witness. That's really, right. It's been a witness against us more than anything. Right. Right. It's been meant something to correct us. But I'm, in, I'm imagining that, it, yeah. that it's something that correct us. But we can see, and in, in what had happened in the past, we were wrong about July 18th. You know, so we had these structures, we had these lines, but, but they weren't, we were misinterpreting them. Well, we were, we were interpreting them. Yeah. Yeah. We were interpreting them. And, and now we hear, we have, Colin and Odilio's um, presentations that are based upon the lines that we had. We also had um, Daniel Vanderhorst, who was mm -hmm. trying to predict events. Mm -hmm. Now, was, you know, and I'm not saying anything bad about him. I'm just saying that I knew that he was going to be disappointed when he was trying to predict what was going to happen with these particular dates that were future. I I'm thinking that's what the ephod is, is the predictions. 
Okay. And, and that to me would make sense. What about other people? Yep. So, so we can see, we, we constructed an epoch. The message of July 18th did not want to be controlling this movement. It didn't want to take away from the message that God had given. But inadvertently it did, mm. right? Because it created this structure now that we were going to then interpret. And, and we could see that became a snare, right? Unto Gideon and to his house. So the message of July 18th got caught up in trying to interpret what was going to happen, trying to predict future events. Now, I've been very, very careful. I mean, I'm aware of the dangers that, that can exist when you have future events. You have future dates on the line, and you don't know what they mean. But it's very tempting to try to say, well, I think this is going to happen. Right? I understand that. But we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what these dates mean, whether it's this date coming up, November 24th, 2022. We have enough light for our feet. Right. And, um, and we know. I don't think we have enough light to predict the next turn in the road. Right. Exactly. And, and we have, we are to measure the time. Right. This comes from Second Ezra's, right? I can't remember which chapter and verse, but you know, we're to measure the time. And then when the time has passed, then we will know that it was the time. That is, we measure the time. This is part of watching and waiting, as far as I'm concerned. Right. We're we're not just watching and waiting is not, you know, turning your back upon prophecy and just, you know. Waiting till one day in the newspaper, you see that a Sunday is going to happen tomorrow, right? We need to be participants in these events as they unfold prophetically. We need to be walking on this path, on this journey. And we have to be careful, though, right? Because there are bypaths. There are directions that we can take because of our human weaknesses, that will make us believe we know and understand things that we don't know and understand. And we are totally dependent upon God uh, in our understanding. Now we can see here that in this ephod, we have these measurements of time, the weight of the golden earrings, right? Uh, all of these different things are symbols that we use for time. So we know that this ephod is relating to time prophecy yeah and i agree and so we can see that this is constructed this ephod and and in a sense this message has constructed this these times these dates but it's being misused so adilio uses these symbols and he constructs a scenario which is correct I mean, it's not really a scenario. He actually analyzes um, the pandemic, but he draws a conclusion from it that this pandemic is directly going to the Sunday law. That we're now part in, in that Sunday law and that pandemic, the vaccine and all those things are going to be uh, involved in the Sunday law, which I don't believe. I believe the Sunday law is about the Sunday law. And then we have Odi uh, Colin and Odilio Green on this um, but Colin's more focused upon Trump. Now, Adilio does his presentations and says, well, if you don't accept the Trump predict prediction, your probation is going to close, right? Because <laughs> he sees these symbols. Now, whether he meant it exactly in that way or not, I don't know. But we know that, that Trump was not going to become president again in fulfillment of any prophecy because he's fulfilled his role. We understood that from the lines already what January 6th, 2021 was about, right? So we're not under any delusion, we shouldn't be, that somehow Trump has to become president again in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled. We can already see where it was fulfilled. Yeah, it's been checked off already. Yeah. But because we don't understand the lines, we don't see that. So 
So I maybe agree. that's maybe that's where we would take the story of Gideon's ephod as just this warning at the end of this this just because we defeat Zeba and Zalmuna doesn't mean we don't have another danger that's lurking because Zeba and Zalmuna it's the ornaments that on the on their camel's necks in part it's also going to be the earrings of the prey right that are mm -hmm. going to be used in the construction of this ephod. And, and, and I've looked at this as a warning to me. I mean, in, in, when we've studied this previously, I can see. There's so a great they were all gold, right? The, the earrings. Yeah. And those symbols of the, on the camel's necks. Yeah. 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 So what do we relate gold to be? Hmm. Gold, gold tried in the fire. Mm. You're talking about so, it, yeah, it, uh, you know exactly. Um, so these things are just making me more and more secure on that ephod being uh, the time predictions. Right. So, but if we don't understand everything, um, we can make we can make mistakes. Mm, so, absolutely. You know, this was my position back in 2018. Uh, I'm coming to an end here. So, but in 2018, I wrote a paper where I plainly laid out why we cannot time set. Now, this is after we had already had the November 9th date and what I thought it meant. Mm. Said it cannot contradict what Ellen White's saying about time setting. That is, that we're dealing with a special case that has to do with dates within this movement and that are not not about external events, predicting external events. And yet we still had this July 18, 2020 date. And that was to me always the concern. I mean, obviously I'm the one who first suggested it. Um, but I understood the possibility that what we were doing was wrong. And so when we made the November 22nd, 2018, the Thanksgiving prediction, Heidi and I had worked on, um, I believe that this was a test to show that we could not predict events or, or we could, right. It was it's you know, a 50, 50 chance, sense, right? <laughs> it, for me, in a sense, it was a fleece and, and, you know, maybe it, it would have something to do in some personal line with the fleece, but it was not accepted by the movement. They didn't want to look at it. They didn't want this prediction and, and they tried to make it like I was trying to predict events on my own which I wasn't. And, and Jeff looked at it and he said, well, this is completely reasonable. This fits in with what we already understand. Um, but he had a different interpretation of, of what it meant even after the event had passed. So, so to me, there was a good indication that we can't predict future events, even if we have a correct structure. And now, and then I was shown dealing with the Mayan calendar, all of these failed predictions that July 18th was, was in this line of, and then warned Jane, uh, uh, Jeff on April 26, 2020, I warned him about what I had seen and that it was a possibility the prediction would fail. But again, he never responded to it other than to say, oh, read, watch the video that you did, the presentation, and read the paper. But he never did respond to it other than that. So, so this movement moved ahead with this ephod, right, that had been constructed from this message. Now, you can see, of course, the message of Zeba and Zalmuna I'm taking as something that Colin and Odilio had presented. But now we're going to go back and repeat and enlarge and show that really what they presented is this is based upon this misunderstanding or misapplication of time, right? It's trying to discern the future based upon chronology, which is not what is meant. What, why we're not, we're not given this chronology to predict future events. We're given it as a witness that the Lord has, is leading us on the path that we are on. Right. I agree. We can look back at events 
and see that God was leading us, but we can't predict events in the future. This has been consistently what I have said throughout this time. And, you know, maybe part of why God allowed me not to be heard in that period up to July 18, 2020, is maybe I would have convinced people uh, that we shouldn't be promoting that date and we wouldn't have given that warning to Nashville. Though I do believe that we needed to give that warning. Um, and so it's hard to go back and sort of second guess yourself or second guess what should have happened. <laughs> but my All message things work is, out for the glory of God, bro. Yeah. So my message is always consistent in that I recognize the chronology was correct. This was given us from God, but that we have to be careful about how we interpret it, that we can't know future events. And God has, of course, been using this message to refine his people, to bring us to the point where we can actually give a message to the Levites, that we can, we can have something that is going to bring a reformation among God's people, because this is about a reform line, and a reform line is about reformation. Right? And so if we're yes. on a reform line and no reforming is happening, uh, then we have a problem. I would say so. <laughs> yeah. But so first, this reformation has to happen with us. Yes, sir. And then this reformation can happen within Adventism. When I look at it, I look at us, myself. I mean, we see how unfit we are for this mm. work. This is the Lord's work. You know, and as we've been studying on, on Friday nights, you know, God's going to take things into his own hands. It'll be evident. Right? And this is the thing that I've been waiting to see ever since I was an Adventist, ever since I was in the upper room Bible studies in my house. And studying these things about the latter rain and, and uh, the loud cry message and the Sunday law, and seeing that God would take this work into his own hands, that, that we would go from place to place with our faces lighted up and our Bibles in our hands right? Directing people. And it's not going to be so much by argument. It's going to be because of the character that we have, the glory of Christ that is seen upon his people. And so here is a message that's been given us, establishing that Adventism is true, that it's set upon a solid foundation, and that gives us the ability to have the confidence that God is real, and that he is working in our lives personally, and that even though we see ourselves as insufficient, as sinners, we know that God can accomplish that which he says he will accomplish. And this movement is set up by God to do that for Adventism. If we will allow him to do that work. So I, I don't know how we would put Gideon's ephod particularly on a line. Uh, maybe the best way to look at it is, is it's just telling us about what Ziba and Zalmunna's messages are based upon. Because I, I don't really see a whole line in it. Are you talking of the ephod there? Uh, the line, a whole line of it. What do you What do you mean? Yeah, the story of the ephod. If If anything, I would put, you know, this all as a warning that's given to this movement. If we're going to put it somewhere, we would put it where we are now, right? Um, yeah, we're we're a product of that ephod, right? And we recognize it now. Yes. But I don't know if I could just take the story of the ephod and put all these on dates on a line. I think it's just something. I'm not that's sure if it's relevant. Me. Right, exactly. Right. And then we have the death of Gideon, which, um, you know, we're going to have to address tomorrow. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Do people feel like we're going in the right direction here? 
I think we we have a better understanding now than we did uh, Thursday. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the way that you have led your people in the past and that you have led this movement and that you have led in this study. We need to be corrected by you, Lord. We ask that you can continue to help each one of us in our personal study to understand these things. We pray that your Holy Spirit can continue to work upon our hearts in convicting us of our sins and of our need of you. And we pray that your angels can watch over each one today, that you can protect us and help us through this day. Bring us together again to study your word if it is according to thy will. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.